Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. You know, this is, as Jarrett Ransom says, Friday, the best day of the week, because we get to do Ask and Answer. And this is like, I think, my most fun thing that I get to do as a co-host of the Nonprofit Show, because it's always a mystery. It's always a challenge. Sometimes it's heartbreaking. Sometimes it's kind of like, duh. And sometimes it's funny. And so... Who better to share this time with than Muhi Kwaja? Muhi's one of the, the trainers at Fundraising Academy. And really interestingly enough, he's co-founder of American Muslim Community Foundation. The Community Foundation system is fascinating. And uh, we're going to be talking with Muhi about this more and, and exploring this again. I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Super excited to have you with us. You know, part and parcel of when we started the nonprofit show now almost four years ago, we made calls to a few folks and all of a sudden we had this tremendous support and it has remained with us nearly 100 or 1000 episodes. And it includes Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, and nonprofit tech talk. You might see a new logo with um, a fundraising academy coming through. So um, that's super cool. Hey, again, if you want to find us, we will meet you where you are. You can download our app, which is free. You can find us on streaming and you can even listen to us in podcast format. So however it works for you, wherever you are, we want to join you. Okay, Muhi, let's dive into it because we have a lot of questions and some of them are kind of tough, but this one, easy. I'm going to throw it to you. How important is it to start a board meeting with a mission moment and what is it actually? Also, is this only for boards or should this be for regular staff meetings? Um, should they include this? This comes to us from Jamila in Los Angeles. Yeah, I love this question. Um, so let's start out with what it is exactly. Um, I would say mission moment is the reason why or a moment when the board member or staff member uh, got to see and witness the mission in action. Maybe they volunteered and they work at a food bank and they got to put together packets for people who were picking them up later in the day or in the week. Um, or they got to witness a installation of fire alarms through Red Cross um, in communities that are more susceptible to home fires. Um, so it could be anything of the sort. Um, and I think they're a great way to start out board meetings. Uh, for staff meetings, if they're weekly, it might be, um, you know, dependent on the size of the team, maybe one person share. Um, but I think they're definitely good for boosting morale and hearing people's why. Right. You know, um, until Jamila wrote this, I have to admit and fess up, I never thought about this for staff meetings. I don't know why. I just thought of it as like a board thing. And mm -hmm. um I know in some cases with boards I've sat on, there are HIPAA issues and privacy issues where you don't, you can't find people to witness, you know, how service impacted them. But in that case, we brought in staff to say, you know, I witnessed this or I did this. And, and so that we could kind of then get a day in the life of the people who were, were working for the organization. But I think it's really important. It doesn't have to be more than five or 10 minutes, but I feel like Muhi, it grounds us and it kind of pulls us back to why we are meeting and what we need to be focusing on. So, um, you know, Jamila, I hope that helps because I don't know, Muhi, I don't think enough people are doing it. And um, so I think it's really an important, important aspect of the whole thing. Let's go to our next question. And this is one, as you know, Muhi, from time to time, I take the person's name off because I'm afraid they're going to be um, unmasked and I don't want to cause problems. So the question is this, I am a CEO and have seen a development officer from another nonprofit do amazing things in our community. Do you have any hints on how I might persuade them to join our organization? Yes, I'm talking about poaching talent. I love that they put it right out there. 
Yeah. I mean, if we're putting it all out there, offer them more money, offer them more benefits, pay them what they're worth. Um, So there's nothing wrong with that. I think uh, you reaching out to another development person would show them that you appreciate the work and value them as a professional. Um, And I think that people should always keep the door open when it comes to learning about other organizations, how they might be a fit. Uh, Maybe they're looking for their next managerial experience and they haven't had that yet, but your organization can provide that. Um, So I I think it's always nice to keep the door open with these types of things. Yeah, I think it's good. And I, and I also think name withheld, you know, reaching out to somebody who you think might be a good fit, chances are they're in a cohort. I mean, like if you like them and you like their behavior, chances are they are surrounding themselves and they use the word cohort, but they're attracted to like-minded people. So maybe it's not them, but maybe they will have a lead for you, right? You know, I mean, you you have to to think about that. I always think about my dear grandmother, Patrick, who I, in um, college, before I met my husband, I was like complaining about men. And she said, look, sister, you have to tell three people a week that you want to date and that you're looking because how no one's going to know. And I always thought that was like hilarious. But you know what? It's kind of good, good advice. We do need to speak up. We need not just about dating movie, because now that you're an engaged man, <laughs> we're talking about that. But you know what I'm saying? Like just to put it out there to say, hey, you know, Everybody, in your case, you know, I just moved to Tampa and I'm looking to build right. a new network. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I'm an expert in the the field of nonprofit, you know, fund development and nonprofit management. If you know anybody who might be a good contact, let me know. I think that's kind of how we build these things. And so name with health, poaching talent. Good luck. But, you know, there's ways to keep going about it. And don't stop just because it's one person. I, I would say keep keep going and, and see what you can come up with. I mean, we know that this is a challenging time for, for talent and finding the right talent. And so I think um it's it's all hands on deck when we when we come to this. Okay, well, let's go to our next question because um this is an interesting question, Muhi. We've had this from time to time. It comes to us from Sam in Chicago, Illinois. And the question is, do you think that someone who comes from the programming side of a nonprofit can ever move to fundraising and be successful? Our leadership team is having a major discussion about this, and we are about split on the answer. It's really interesting. Yeah. Because you're good at one thing, are you going to be good it, it's something else. I think having the knowledge and the details and the understanding of the efficiency and the strengths of the programs is oftentimes what makes a fundraiser successful. So already having somebody with that skill set and understanding of how things work on the programmatic side, if they can feel comfortable building relationships. Maybe somebody who's on the programming side isn't a extroverted personality. And not even that you need to be extroverted to be a successful fundraiser, but more in the sense that feeling comfortable with building relationships, being more of a spokesperson for the organization. Uh, I think it's more about personality than it is about experience. Uh, They often say a salesperson can easily move into a fundraising role, but I've seen salespeople be terrible fundraisers um, and vice versa. So I think that someone can be successful as a fundraiser coming from the programmatic side. Uh, And I've seen it in some of my colleagues where they've made a shift internally and they were fantastic as fundraisers and relationship builders. Um, And, you know, I think that there are things that take time for people to get used to and, and understand but I think that they can be very strong fundraisers for sure. Okay, put up your Tampa Devil Rays catcher's mitt because here comes a curveball. <laughs> um, would you, uh, okay, there you go. <laughs> you know, I'm in my 60s and one of my big sorrows is I never learned how to do a pop-up slide. It's too late now. 
but I'm just saying in next, my next life, I'm going to start early. So I know how to do a pop-up slide. Okay. But my go, going back, my question is, would you as a fundraiser ever think about bringing somebody from programming to a meeting? So not that it's sealed one, two punch, but it, that it's, like you have that expert to talk. I mean, I ask this question all the time. You really? Okay. Oh, yeah. I've asked this question before and people have said, no, it screws up my mojo. But, yeah. <laughs> well, I believe as a fundraiser, it's not about me. It's about managing the relationship and what's going to speak best to the donor, right? Maybe they want to hear from a CEO. Maybe they want to hear from the CDO. Maybe they want to hear from a volunteer, a okay. staff member, a board member. I keep it all open. And definitely from the programmatic side, if a donor has interest in funding a specific program, you better bet that they're going to hear from a program officer. Um, so it's not the fundraiser show. It's really the donor yeah. show and what they want. So forget about my mojo. It's about getting the donor what they want. Okay. So then in, I'm thinking to the cause selling cycle. And for those of you mm -hmm. who've been with us, who've watched, I mean, Muhi's worked with us on this before, you know, the cause selling cycle is a very structured, but logical and natural way to navigate the relationship that you want to create or steward with your donor. And you're thinking about that. At what point would you bring in that that talent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it could be in presentation. It could be in handling objections. Oh, okay. um, and I think that might be a way to introduce other people on your team to the donor. Um, so I think those would probably be the two best fits within the cost selling cycle to introduce a colleague. And now that we're getting back out in, you know, the post COVID world, um, do you think that that you're going to start to see more tours where, um, you know, on site tours where you would actually have that physical engagement? Or is that is that old school thinking? No, I think it's still very relevant, whether it's virtual or in person, okay. um, engaging the um, staff member with the donor. Sometimes it's even a phone call or a follow up on email exchange and looping them in, and you know, so many different touch points that can be effective uh, based on the donor's preference. But again, if it's a multi year pledge and it's going to support programs and it's at a higher level, a major gift you want to insert those touch points and give the donor confidence. Uh, and I know that as a fundraiser, I'm really a relationship manager. And yes, I can provide as much information, but I think it strengthens the relationship with the donor to pull in other advocates who have a strong sense of the programs and other features within the organization who can share their mission moments and why. Uh, so I think it goes to further deepening the relationship with the donor and that's what it's all about i'm fascinated that you put it in that way because i think a lot of times in fundraising we're like okay we got the check we got the you know tick that off okay on to the next but i really loved what you had to say about navigating that through and it's not just about bringing that talent or that mission moment witness um and then letting it going on to the next thing because um, that's, that's not such a smart, a smart thing. Um, you know, and a really interesting. So Sam, I hope that that happens, uh, for you and that you are able to bring that talent into the discussion and, um, not, not being so siloed and, and allowing that talent to change, um, because maybe it goes the other way too. Maybe you find somebody from, fundraising who you know wants to navigate into programming you never know but um it seems to me like i hear more about folks that are in programming navigating forward um i want to before we move on to our next question because this kind of is something that happened to me personally and i want to get your take on it so i have a sister who is a special uh education professional she is highly educated, um, is on the 
and at the end of her career has been an award-winning teacher, predominantly working with uh, students with autism. And she asked me to attend a fundraising event for a child-centric program who she feels is a really strong program. And she knows their work and has seen this organization grow. And it was, it was a gala event um, this past Saturday. Um, so I said, great, no problem. You know, I've been on the rubber chicken circuit my whole life. Let's see, <laughs> let's support them, yada, yada, yada. So she's like, great. She said, they're using a new app and um, our tickets and everything are in it. And we can go log on early and check in early and um, even make a donation and, and take care of that, you know, um, for for the event, um, or we can wait for a paddle race. I'm like, great. So we go in and um, she does the app and it's all great. We go in, it's lovely. It's an amazing event. And then towards the end of the event where there's a paddle race, her name came up on this big screen. Now this was at a at a professional um, performance auditorium. So it wasn't mm -hmm. just like a little screen. It was a stage, right? And uh, my sister's name is Jamie. And it was like, thank you, Jamie Patrick, for being you know a sponsor. And it was huge. And I was like, wow, Jamie, you know, that's amazing. They know your work and they're honoring you. And she's like, well, yeah, okay, that's weird, you know. <laughs> And then they started the paddle raise. They brought her name up. They 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 didn't bring her up, but they kept on this screen saying, Jamie Patrick, thank you so much for being a big sponsor. And then another, so we're into this for like 10 minutes. And then a screen comes up and it says, thank you, Jamie Patrick, for your $250,000 donation. Whoa. Well, she had made a donation of $250 on this new app and obviously it was a mistake i got to laughing hysterically because i thought it was one of the funniest things <laughs> i'd ever seen and she was like will you stop laughing and i was like sister this is hilarious but <laughs> so we had to wait because we were kind of you know we didn't want to get up in the middle of the whole thing and say no it was only 250 dollars." but muhi so we uh, i'll finish the story we went to the check-in desk and I said, my sister made a $250 uh, donation by pressing a button on her phone um, and it registered as 250,000. And they're like, oh gosh, that's terrible. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Corrected it, $250. Two things happened. Well, you know, my sister was just beside herself. I'm like, don't worry about it. We'll fix this, right? You know, because this is the world I live in. I mean, I'm like, you know, you're good to go. But two things happened. This app had a thermometer on the on the screen the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I said, do not do this until your event is over because it'll strip out $250,000 immediately. And a thousand people sitting in this auditorium will wonder what the heck happened, right? And so mm -hmm. we don't want to impinge upon the the goodwill and, and the excitement that's going forward. And then, and they're like, okay, that's that's generous. We'll do that. But Muhi, this is the thing. All that staff, all those people, they had their iPads, they had their phones. They knew what was coming in before the event. And sure. nobody was standing out there waiting for Jamie Patrick. Mm. Nobody was like, Jamie, who, who is this woman? We don't know who she is, right? How did we get a quarter of a million dollar donation? Nobody yeah. looked at the stewardship of that or to say that it was an error. Interesting. Was, so I wanted to, to share that crazy story with you um, because I wanted to know what you thought and if you could kind of shed any light yeah, I think your insight is spot on. Like somebody who was managing the event and working with the technology should have caught that before the event, seeing, oh my God, we've already raised yeah. 
quarter of a million dollars. Like this is at awesome. least well for one person. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think exactly that whoever the event manager was or development person in charge of the technology working with them should have communicated that with the organization and had some plan of action for welcoming uh, your sister in and all of that. Yeah. So these errors often happen. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why it's good to check before, during, and after what the status is of these certain technologies um, and capabilities and really learning the ins and outs. And maybe this organization had a consultant managing the back end of things and didn't communicate that with the team to prep them. Um, so there could have been some sort of miscommunication and opportunity there. Uh, but definitely really interesting to see, you know, what their overall goal was, where this landed them, um, how they utilize the information before the event, during the event, after the event. Yeah. Well, and it's fascinating to me because if I were a person and there were some heavy hitters there, so it was possible. Uh, so there were, when they did the paddle call, there were two $100,000 paddle races just on the hundred thousand. So, I mean, it, and so they went, they went over a million dollars. Well, well over a million dollars that in that short 30 minute period, mm -hmm. um, which we know you and I know, you know, that those probably were not a shock that they knew that that those sure. were going to come in. So it was a little theater, a little orchestration, a little public rah, rah, and which is, is fine. But, you know, what's fascinating to me is that if they thought that it was an error, okay, mm -hmm. they would have addressed it. But more importantly, if they did think it was an error, that's a missed opportunity for stewardship, right? Of course. Yeah. I mean, it, absolutely a fascinating, fascinating story. Of course, it has provided me with a tremendous amount of <laughs> levity and humor and I've really enjoyed it, um, pestering my sister over this. So I just had to like bring that up because it was quite a fun thing. But I did know you, I knew you were coming on today and I really wanted to kind of launch into that a little bit and see what your thoughts were. We, my friend, have time for one more question. And knowing that um, now you have a fiance in fine arts, this question is a hoot because <laughs> I, I can't it wait to It was meant to be. It was meant to be. And it comes from Name Withheld, City Withheld. And again, because our arts, arts organizations are very small and it's easy to figure out who these people are across the country. The question goes like this. We want to hire a new CEO for our arts and culture organization. There are some on the search committee who feel strongly that only someone from the arts and culture sector should be considered. What do you advise? Yeah, I think... Keeping it an ultimatum as only is limiting. Mm -hmm. uh, I think as long as there are candidates within the arts and culture sector and there are candidates from outside, maybe they have a really strong translatable skill set and acknowledgement. Maybe they worked in the health or education sector, but are really strong suited to be a CEO. And maybe they've been a CEO of a past organization and they're looking for that sector transition in their own career to be more versatile down the road. Mm -hmm. So I think limiting it to only arts and culture uh, is a hindrance. You're not doing your service to your organization. Um, but at the end of the day, you always want the strongest candidate. So <laughs> if you do interview candidates from within and outside of the arts and culture sector, mm -hmm. I think you'll have a stronger pool of candidates. Um, so I've, you know, I've been passed up for development roles because I didn't have arts and culture experience. Um, but I think that I still would have had a lot to offer the organization um, as somebody who is a strong development leader. So, you know, I can see it going both ways. Well, you know, I think in the arts and culture space, oftentimes we have two roles. We have that artistic director who does programming and does the artistic work. 
And then we have the CEO and they do the nuts and bolts of operational management. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's a, a really big thing. Now that's two big egos. That's two big salaries and that's two big office spaces. And it's not always an easy thing to find a GM, you know, general manager who can run an organization artistically and creatively doesn't always work on the business side. So kind of, you kind of kind of figure out where you are within that structure of that organization because um it's it's a lot of it's different skill sets big time but i i i feel like you need that ceo piece to your point movie to kind of structure the organization keep it on track know the business aspect um and then let that right. let that creative work on the programming um, and and maybe the organization should choose between like somebody who has been a ceo before but not in an arts and culture organization or somebody who's never been a ceo but really strong program manager really strong operations but never been a ceo right what would they do in that scenario then right so, that's a know. good yeah i love that because that is totally different um, and so, yeah, very interesting questions this week. Um, thank you so much, you know, for for being a part of this. Uh, Muhi Kawaja, MPA, CFRM, trainer at Fundraising Academy and the co-founder of the American Muslim Community Foundation. Um, really, you have a varied um, career and a storied career. And it's really a cool thing to, to get your opinion and your insight um, as to you know, all things nonprofit and how they work. My pleasure. Yeah. We Thanks always, for the opportunity. Yeah. We always love having you here, Mui. And uh, it's, it's great. It's like a family. We don't always have to agree, but we have to be respectful. <laughs> so that's what <laughs> I think I love about Fridays is that we always get different opinions and uh, they're not always expected. So again, we have amazing partners with us. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out so we can have these amazing conversations like we've had today with Muhi Kwaja. Coming to us from Tampa, Florida, and um, newly affianced. How cool is that? Thank you. I'm That's excited. Yeah, you should be. That's a good thing. That's proof that there's goodness in the world and things keep moving forward. So I appreciate that. Hey, everybody, as we end every episode of The Nonprofit Show, we end with this reminder, and that is to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here on Monday. Muhi, thank you so much.